So, it was Christmas season, 16 years ago. Sorry, I'm making myself younger. 18 years ago. And, uh, it was about this time of year. It was about 5.30 at night, and I was sitting, I was sitting behind a steering wheel, and my palms were sweating. My heart was racing, and I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified, close to tears, terrified. I heard this voice next to me saying, it's okay. If you're scared, I'm with you, I'm here. You can do it. Just put the car in drive. Now see, what happened just a few months later was, or earlier was, I was in a car accident. I was driving down the road, in the middle of the night, and I was hit head on by a drunk driver who had no headlights on. And it uh, caused me to experience plastic surgery and then severe back injuries. Um, this time during Christmas, this season, this very moment that we're in right now, was a time where as a young man, I had to get past the fear of driving in the dark. It's an amazing thing that what happens to the psyche when you're driving in the dark and you see nothing in front of your headlights, but then everything changes in an instant. And you never saw it coming. And the fear that grips you from that point is something I didn't think I was uh, able to feel. Something that I didn't think was going to happen. That, that something so significant yet small would would shake me to the core to where as a teenage young a teenage boy that I was afraid to drive at night because the dark scared me. The interesting thing though is that I think for some of us this traumatic dread, this post-traumatic feeling is the same thing we feel as we enter this season. And it can be for some of us this darkness that comes in. Something happened where there was something that you never saw coming. It could be that uh, there's a relationship that is broken. And, and, and as you go into Thanksgiving and as you think towards Christmas, the fact that you need to enter into this relationship or see these people that you would never hang out with otherwise looms on you. With the dread of this season because, let's be honest, it requires a lot more money than we usually need. I mean, some of us just dread the family gatherings, period. I heard somebody say yesterday, why do we have to get together once a year with people we would never hang out with otherwise? That can be the way it is. And for some of you, it's this the consumerism. It's, it's, you know, it's Christmas is coming and I have to get gifts for everybody and, and, and everybody wants something and I have to get something right and it's, it seems like you're getting a flood of text messages and phone calls and, and everybody wants to know what they should get for your kids and you need to know what you're supposed to get for everybody and it's just so looming. It ruins the entire thing. Some of you like Black Friday. I don't know. I'll pray for you later, especially. <laughs> uh, but nothing, I, it seems like in this Christmas season we see the ugliness of people that we usually don't see. I mean, who hasn't been rocked by watching what happens at a Walmart when the doors open at 5 a.m. on Friday morning? You know, those videos are, are shocking to us. The hyper-consumerism is something else. Some of you, it's, uh, it's the weight gain that bothers you, the dread of that. Or, or seeing your aunt who reminds you that you haven't lost the weight gain from last Christmas Thanksgiving <laughs> season. And, uh, you're going to have to make a uh, New Year's resolution that you know that you're going to break again. But for some of us, it's a lot It's a lot more serious than that. For some of us, just like it was for me 18 years ago, Christmas magnifies a situation in your heart that's there the other 11 months of the year. But for some reason, you can't ignore it during this time. Like I said before, it's the relationships that are broken. It's the grief, maybe, that someone that you've lost within the last year, maybe someone you've lost 20 years ago and never really went away. For some of us, it's uh, an illness. 
and moving into this season of time with an illness and with, with our bodies being broken, it, it really, for some reason, seems to have magnified the entire season. And Christmas is this time of joy, and it is. And, and, and I don't mean to be a, a Debbie Downer, but it's the truth that during this season, there's also this kind of shadow side to Christmas. This thing that happens. So, I want to play a what if for the next few weeks as we talk about Christmas. I want to play a what if as we rediscover or discover Christmas. What if we looked at this season not just as a celebration, but we looked at it as an invitation. An invitation to step into those places within our lives there's places that cause us dread. There's places that are darkness in our lives. There's places where we sit and we're behind the steering wheel and our palms are sweaty and our heart is beating and broken. It's an invitation rather than allow that to control and to steal the hope that is Jesus Christ, but rather to step into this season and allow Him to transform it into what it's supposed to be, which is a season of joy that our King came. He changed everything and He's coming again. Amen. So as we rediscover Christmas, let us, let us look at the characters of Christmas. Let's see how, through the darkness, God broke into their lives. And I believe that through their responses to God's inbreaking, we will learn how we can transform our lives this Christmas. Because here's the thing, this is what I believe, as we, as we learn about Christmas our faith is going to grow. And none of us is going to suffer from this funny word I found this week that's called Festolisphobia. This is a real thing. The fear of Christmas. But instead of fear, we're going to replace it with faith. Because I believe that faith in God's promises produces courage in our circumstances. Faith in God's promises produces courage in our circumstances. So today we're going to look at the faith of one of our Christmas characters. His name is Joseph. So if you want to follow along today, we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The words are going to be on the screen for those of you that wish to follow along that way. But if you, if you want to turn to your Bibles, this will be the time to do so. Matthew 1, verse 18 to 25. The Christmas story begins this way. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now betrothed is a word that we maybe don't use very often. It's kind of different from an engagement. It was more of an arranged marriage. So before the children were of age to get married, a, a parent would go. To, uh, a parent of a son would go to the parent of a daughter, and, and uh, he would, and they would say, "Hey, would you like your daughter to marry my my son?" And, and then they would enter this agreement, and there would actually be a prenup to this agreement, and and it was actually considered at that time that they were married. The only way it could be broken, this binding agreement could be broken, was through divorce, and so. They were betrothed, they were married, and they had not come together, that's, you know, an idiom, that they had not been sexually active together, but yet she was found to be pregnant with a child. In fact, we know from other places that she was found to be four months pregnant because she spent four months with Elizabeth, who gave birth to John the Baptist. So this is the situation. We, we've heard this so many times, but Joseph is engaged to Mary. They're not yet married. They haven't been together yet. And all of a sudden, she's found to be with a child. Now, let's be honest about this. How would you feel, guys, if you are if you were, uh, engaged uh, to be your girlfriend or you know anybody that you knew would come up to you and you know that you've never been active together and, and she said, I'm pregnant. But guess what? I promise you, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Think about that. I know, that, I know we listen to these Christmas stories. For some of us, we've heard them for a long time. But think about that. Or here's another thing for you parents. Your son or your daughter, your, your son is engaged or, or your, your daughter's engaged to be married. They swear to you they've, they've never had sex, but yet they came to you and they said, yes, she's pregnant. Four months, in fact. It's the Holy Spirit. How many of you would be a little bit skeptical at this point? 
I think this is probably the Lord's one and done, just for those of you that are trying to pull this off. But um, <laughs> this is probably the Lord's one and done, right? But let's let's rip this out of the let's let's rip this out of the pages of this text and let's look at this the reality. This is a pretty situ serious situation, and so it goes on and it says, her husband Joseph, being a just man and willing and unwilling to put her to shame. Plan to resolve the divorce quietly. You see, what Joseph could have done, I don't know if you know this, but as, a, as her husband, if she was pregnant, it was obviously assumed that she committed adultery, even though they weren't technically really married yet. And uh, she would have been considered to be an immoral person. And as an adulteress, according to Moses' law, he could have her stoned to death. But it says that Joseph wouldn't do that. In fact, because he was a just man, because he was a righteous man, he didn't want her to put her to shame. Instead, Joseph was such a good man that he took her shame on himself. You see, because as, as, as a man that Joseph was, for him not to put her to shame meant that everyone was going to be talking about him. Rather than talking about her, he was not actually doing his duty and putting her to shame. He wasn't divorcing her. He wasn't either casting her out or having her stoned. But Joseph made the choice. I'm going to take this on myself. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to just divorce her quietly. No one's going to know about it. She's not going to be put to shame. And if anybody finds out about it, well, then I'll take it on myself as shame. But the Lord says that, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So Joseph's actually having, I think, a restless night's sleep here. I think it's pretty common, I would think, if you're, if you're Joseph and you just found out that your fiancé is pregnant with God's baby and you don't want to put her to shame, that you're going to have a restless night's sleep as you're working with this. And God breaks into his issue, breaks into his moment, breaks into his darkness and says, do not fear. For those of you today that are in that place where you feel like you're behind the steering wheel and your palms are sweating, and there's a feeling and a weight of dread, a weight of fear, a weight of overwhelm with something this Christmas. I believe the Lord wants you to know that you are not to fear. Because when God breaks in and says, do not fear, He's saying something else. He's saying that I am here and I am in control. God uses angels, God uses moments, God uses sermons, I hope, to say to people all the time, do not fear and to direct their minds and hearts away from their situation and to their Savior. And that's what the angel's just about to do for Joseph. He's about to say, do not fear, not only is the Holy Spirit, but he goes on. He says, she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now for Joseph, this was kind of a big deal because the name Jesus was actually a name that people used commonly throughout that time. Jesus wasn't the only Jesus amongst his peers. It was a name that was actually comes out of Hebrew, meaning Yeshua. Often the Hebrew is translated to something different, which is Joshua. So people at Jesus' time would name their sons Jesus to remind them of one thing. Yeshua literally means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. And so just as Hannah and Robbie said, for thousands of years people were hoping that there would be a Jesus that came. Somebody who would save them from their sins. Somebody that would save them from Roman occupation. Somebody that would save them from themselves. Somebody that would save them from brokenness. The, hearts, the, the heart of God said through an angel to Joseph, do not fear, I am, I am at work. Direct your heart and mind away from your situation and turn to a Savior. A Savior who you hoped for. In fact, to make it obvious, name of Jesus. Because He's going to save His people from His sins. And then Matthew breaks into the story, the writer of the book, and he lets us know that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew, Matthew the writer of this, also wants you and I to know, not only is this what happened, not only did the angel tell Joseph, Jesus is coming, 
God's keeping his promises. He is who he said he is, but he's also telling those of us now that are reading it that this was something that happened to fulfill a prophecy that occurred hundreds of years prior. <clears throat> that a virgin would be with a son, and she would, she would bear the son, and they would call his name Emmanuel. That God was actually breaking into the world, and it was changing everything. So this is what Joseph receives in a dream, and he has a choice, as do we today. He has a choice to believe it, or he has a choice to think that he's, you know, whatever he had for dinner the night before was messing with his mind. He has a choice to believe that God actually was breaking into the moment, breaking into the struggle, or he had a choice to believe that it was a figment of his imagination. But the Bible says that Joseph woke from his sleep and he, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, and he knew her not until she had given birth to his son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph was obedient to what, the, to, to what the Lord asked him to do. Joseph's faith in this circumstance is more remarkable than we give him credit. Now don't get me wrong, we're going to talk about Mary next week, so don't get upset with me ladies. But Mary gets a lot of credit for her faith. And, and, and the prayer that she says when she finds out that she's pregnant is beautiful. But Joseph really had a huge amount of faith in this moment. For him, let's, I'm going to harp on this one more time, for him, the shame that he would carry on himself for not doing away with her ruined his reputation. And the dark night that he had, the dread that he had, the having to have a conversation with his parents, the having to have a conversation with his friends, not doing away with her quietly, but actually staying with her, was a big deal. And the reason he was able to come through that moment is because he believed that God actually was at work. God actually was keeping His promise. And I believe that's because faith in God's promises produce courage in our circumstances. <coughs> I think most of us, I know I'm perfectly guilty, we make decisions in our lives not based upon promises but often our fears. The worst thing that could happen is how we leverage what we're going to do. We don't often take steps of faith. We often take steps to protect against fear. And I think that's something our society wants us to do on a regular basis. But God was calling Joseph to take a risk. He was calling Joseph to step into this situation and believe that he was at work. He was calling Joseph to faith-filled courage. So let's talk about this word faith. I believe a simple definition for faith is believing that God can be trusted and He will do as He has promised to do. That's what Hannah read this morning. And if we don't believe that today, whatever your situation is, whatever's looming in your heart as we enter this Christmas, that there is a God who's able to transcend whatever it is bothering you, and actually there's a God at work in whatever is going on, that there's a God of restoration, then we're, le we're left to live our life with fear. It's one or the other. It's a choice of one or the other. But believing who God is, believing He is who He said He is, what He promised to do is what's, what He's going to do, is faith. Now, courage is something else. Courage is... There's another typo. <laughs> courage is stepping. That's supposed to be an S. I do this every once in a while just so none of you think I'm perfect. Oh. <laughs> courage is stepping forward out of the belief in something or someone that's greater than ourselves. It's interesting when we, when we live life out of fear, when we think of the worst case scenario, we're often limited in fear out of the reality of our own insecurities and our own inability to conquer whatever we're facing. But when we live life out of faith, we're able to have courage because we believe that it's not up to us to transcend the moment. There's something else at work. There's someone else at work. Someone greater than ourselves. Faith-filled courage. So, as we begin this Advent, I have to ask, what is your Joseph moment this Christmas? What is the situation that as I was speaking in the beginning and talking about what looms what makes your heart sink? What you dread this Christmas? 
Those things in your life that as we enter the Christmas season, you think, oh, there's this person that I'm going to have to see. There's this situation that I ignore the other 11 months of the year that I'm going to have to deal with. Oh, there's this person at work who completely can't stand Christmas, can't stand Christians, doesn't believe in Jesus, and all they do is spend all four weeks talking about it. What is it? What's your Joseph moment? What's the moment that God wants you to take faith-filled courage and step into? Believing that He has the ability to break into the situation through the darkness and transcend it through His power at work in you. What's your Joseph moment? For some of you, it's simple. You've given up too quickly on making an impact and maybe God's saying to you, uh, you know, that neighbor that you never see, the neighbor who I keep telling you you need to make a relationship with them because they don't know anything about Jesus. You don't know that out of your head, you know that in your heart and you've never talked to them. And they're really difficult to ever talk to because they, they pull into the garage and they back out of the garage and you actually never see their face. That neighbor, fake them something and go over it and just make a relational connection with them. And it's just a small step. But you know Jesus. And God wants you to make a connection. For some of you, it's a little bit harder though. For some of you, it's going to be a habit to break. There's something that's gripping you. There's something that's, that's bothering you. There's a habit that you cannot get out of. And God is saying to you right now this morning, through this Christmas season, I want you to enter in. I want you to take a step that I'm at work. And believe that I'm more powerful than you are. And I can transform it this Christmas season. Others of you, it's going to be a relationship. It's going to be that family member that, as I'm speaking right now, enters your mind because you don't want to see them. In fact, two days ago was too much. Or maybe they're far from the Lord. Or maybe your relationship is broken with one of your family members and you haven't seen them. You're not going to see them in Thanksgiving. You're not going to see them at Christmas. God's asking you this morning to take, a jo to take a Joseph step. He's asking you to believe that He is the God of restoration, and as you take a step of faith, that He can bring about restoration in your relationships. It's believing that He's at work, believing He can do it, or it's choosing fear of the otherwise. For some of you, it's a step towards love, or it's a step towards that coworker that hates Christmas. And it's finding a way to introduce them to Jesus. Or just telling them why it makes a difference in your life. But I think we'd be wasting this season if we allowed our fears, allowed our dreads, allowed those things in our lives that want to rob this season of joy. To be what controls us. As Christians, as the people of God, why would we allow Christmas to be taken away from us by the circumstances of this life? or the culture that surrounds us. I, for one, want to take a Joseph moment. I, for one, want to have faith in God's promises so that He will produce in me the courage to transcend the moments of my life for His glory. I, for one, want to discover Christmas in a new way this year. And I want to invite God to break in and change me I hope you do too. Let's pray.